algorithm for calculating wrapped uh, Fukaya categories. Um, but yeah, so, well, yeah, let me start over here. So first, uh, definition, which is a little bit imprecise, but, um, so a Weinstein manifold is, um, a symplectic manifold uh, which can be built by uh, attaching uh, what are called Weinstein handles to um, contact isotropic submanifolds. So built by <coughs> attaching uh, let me just call them symplectic handles. And then along uh, isotropics in kind of uh, successive contact boundaries. So, the kind of simplest example of this um, is, uh, well, you could say take like a cotangent bundle, um, and then if we take a Morse function from the cotangent bundle, R, which just looks something like, um, you know, uh, a half p squared a. Let me do this. Is that this is good? Um, so plus a Morse function on the base. Then you'll get kind of a handled decomposition of this as a symplectic manifold, which kind of has the same structure as the Morse decomposition on the base. Um, so in particular, all symplectic handles are kind of exact. And so uh, in particular, uh, Weinstein manifolds are Louisville manifolds. Uh, and yes. Um, now, on the other hand, um, any uh, anything which is Stein, meaning it's properly holomorphically embedded into CN, is also Weinstein. And in fact, the converse is also true, but I um, won't really talk about this. So this is due to uh, Ellie Ashberg. And um, well, of course, uh, you know, smooth affine implies that it's Stein, so that also implies that it's Weinstein. Um, OK, but so what I want to talk about is if I'm given a, um, and, and this is you know, pretty easy to prove because you just, um, you, know, you just take your Morse function defining your symplectic handles to just be like norm squared like as a function on CN and just restrict it, right? Um, but so what I want to actually talk about is if I'm given an affine manifold, an affine variety, so that's kind of given as some set of polynomials, right? I want to talk about explicitly, like in practice, how do we go to getting some collection of isotropics in a contact manifold um, and like draw pictures of them kind of explicitly, like what does that involve? Um, but before talking about that, let me maybe say uh, sort of 
Why? Why should we care? Like, why is this a nice way to look at uh, Weinstein manifolds? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, to my mind, there's there's kind of three uh, useful things here, and um, I mostly focus on one, but let me mention all three. So, uh, first of all, um, it's generally uh, easier to prove um, that uh, <coughs> explicit symplectomorphisms uh, between uh, examples and kind of the reason for this is well um, just in general contact structures kind of have more uh, they're a bit squishier than symplectic manifolds you can kind of stretch them a little bit more um, but also besides that there's kind of a robust theory of uh, contact flexibility which kind of is useful um, so, as an example, um, <clears throat> there's something called the Chorus Russell uh, threefold. So, this is defined by, uh, if I remember correctly, sorry I didn't write this down, but uh, z cubed plus x equals zero, I think. So, this is what's called uh, Chorus Russell. Um, and it was uh, sort of originally studied because it's um, an interesting example of an uh, affine variety which is uh, diffeomorphic to C3, but it's algebraically distinct from C3. Um, so we're able to prove uh, kind of using these methods, so I guess we could call this a theorem. Um, by the way, so. Uh, Everything I'm going to say today is joint work with Roger Cassels. Um, so the theorem is that uh, C is actually uh, symplectomorphic to C3. Um, and sort of, I don't really know any way to prove this without going through contact geometry. Um, but, okay, so that, that's one sort of thing. Um, the second sort of thing is that um, there's kind of a, a nice uh, way to build um, Lagrangian uh, cobordisms uh, between Legendrians. Um, and so, what now this can be used for is so th uh, this picture. Uh, can construct uh, closed exact uh, Lagrangians in uh, these affine varieties, which I'll generally denote by capital X. Um, <clears throat> so as an example of this, um, if you take the manifold x squared y to the 2k plus 1 plus uh, and stabilize it in the sense that Elsa was saying yesterday. And so this is a subset of uh, cm plus 1, so some uh, affine uh, hypersurface. It's kind of a uh, Milner fiber of a non-isolated singularity, if you like. Um, 
So this thing doesn't have any Lagrangian spheres, I believe. Actually, let me take that back. Pretty sure that's true, but I'm, I'm not totally sure. But what it does have is, um, so if I call this x, so contained in x is an exact Lagrangian copy of s n minus 1, uh, the non-orientable kind of uh, twisted product with s1, so like Klein bottle. Um, and yeah, well, this is the sort of thing that's just, um, as soon as you have this kind of contact description of the manifold, it's kind of easy to find these sort of things if they exist usually, because you can just essentially draw pictures of them. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I um, could call this the mapping torus of the orientation reversing diffeomorphism of the sphere. Oh. Um, in particular, if n is 2, it's a Klein bottle. Um, and um, so, yeah, so now the final kind of thing uh, that um, I'd like to talk about and really kind of focus on in this lecture is that this uh, it gives an efficient way to uh, calculate the Rapp Fukai category of the manifold. Um, <clears throat> and well, the reason for this is kind of a couple things. So um, first of all, we kind of generally expect, I guess is a way to put it, that uh, the Legendrian contact homology of uh, lambda is, so er, I should really write this as chain complex. So this is a DGA. Um, so this is quasi-isomorphic as an infinity algebra, or A infinity ca category, if this is a link, to um, the Rapp Fukaya category of X. Um, if X well, is uh, isomorphic to just a subcritical manifold union uh, handles attached uh, along the Legendrian lambda. Um, so th at present, this is something of an informal kind of guiding principle. Um, so uh, to give a few references, so uh, this is uh, due to uh, Bourgeois, Ekholm, and Eliashberg were kind of, I think, the first paper that really pointed in this direction, um, and uh, in particular, kind of also relying on the appendix that uh, Maidansky and uh, Ganatra have inside of this paper. Um, they don't mention wrapped Fukai category at all, or even wrapped uh, homology. Um, but they have these type of uh, isomorphisms kind of between the contact world and the uh, symplectic floor theoretic world. Um, also, there's, this isn't a paper that's so constrained by like proving things, so um, it's, <laughs> you know, this is kind of light. Um, also, I should say, uh, I there's uh, 
work in progress, I believe, by uh, Ekholm and Lakili. Um, so this is work in progress, but um, you know, it's a bit more like, uh, well, precise, both in terms of like, you know, um, well, being more precise, but also explicitly being uh, a relationship with wraps homology. Um, okay, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm just gonna kind of assume that this is true, like just unilaterally. Um, oh, I should also mention, it's my understanding that this kind of only works under characteristic zero, um, but yeah. That's okay with me. Um, and yeah, um, I'm just gonna kinda assume this because, well, it's mere symmetry, why not? Um, so, um, now an e example um, of this that I wanna kind of use as a guiding example throughout the talk is, um, let's say we take x, to be the manifold x, y, z plus x plus z plus one is zero. Um, so this, uh, yeah, has a hypersurface in C three. Um, so um, then the claim. Right, that, well, I don't, I guess I'll write it as a theorem, though it's uh, kind of a, a bunch of different pieces and only like a small fraction of this is due to us, but, um, but anyway, yeah. So the kind of theorem is that the uh, wrapped uh, Foucault category of X is, uh, isomorphic to um, uh, C adjoin X, Y, Z modulo this relation. Um, And so this is kind of essentially saying that X is self-mirror, right? Because in the case where the wrap Fukai category is a commutative algebra, then you kind of just take the mirror by taking the spec of it, right? Um, particularly since we're in the affine world here, and so we're kind of only interested in uh, grading zero things, and so the structure sheaf is gonna generate. Um, <clears throat> okay, and um, yeah. But so this is kind of just a particular example, um, whereas, uh, you know, in some sense, this is kind of uh, works in many cases, and uh, yeah, I think many examples can kind of conform to this. Hmm? So modules on the right-hand side have an obvious metrical structure. Would you geometrically describe that on the right side? Like what a tensor product of two would rise into itself? So when I say that this is isomorphic, what I mean is that this is isomorphic <coughs> to a category with one object whose self hom space is this. So, um, by tensor product, well, there's no, there's no, there's not a derived, this isn't de Fouque here, this is actually Fouque. Um, I mean, in particular, like you can take D of both sides, but um, if we're lucky that Fouque is commutative anyway, like why bother, I guess. Um, in general, there's sort of an algebraic obstruction uh, that I have no idea how to solve, um, which is that like, because what, what this actually does is computes 
the Fukai category, not defuk. Um, now, in terms of constructing mirrors, there's still kind of a problem that um, if we calculate the wrapped category and it's a non-commutative category, I have no idea whether or not this is Merida equivalent to a commutative category. And so it's not clear whether uh, the mirror should be like a commutative space or not. Uh, yes, yes, which is, um, I mean, there are, uh, I'm not sure the categorical language, but there are sort of compact objects, like, com yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So I guess it's kind of deriving any, yeah, okay. So, so here's what I actually mean, and this is kind of where it gets into uh, Scheele and Maxime's work. Um, what this actually is isomorphic to is the subcategory, uh, the full subcategory, given by all the co-cores of the uh, decomposition which then they show split generates the manifold, uh, split generates the category. So yeah, so I guess in that case, it's probably better to have a D here anyway, since we're talking about split generate. But um, yeah, okay. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Like, probably everyone in this room is better at category theory than I am, so like, you know, stop me and like correct my statements. Um, okay, um, now I just, uh, before kind of going into detail, I also want to just kind of say what's the scope of this. Um, and as I kind of see it, I think there's a big upside and a big downside. So the upside, is that um, this sort of needs no, uh, no symmetries like, uh, you know, anything like a torque picture is kind of irrelevant uh, to this. Um, so because it's sort of done using uh, really soft kind of mostly topological methods up to this point. Um, it's kind of, you know, even in cases where there are symmetry, like this particular X, um, there's uh, the way that we're actually working is by kind of breaking the symmetry and throwing it away. Um, and so this kind of extends to many examples that I think um, were a bit uh, harder to get to. Um, the sort of downside, though, is that um, this picture of Weinstein and kind of contact geometry is inherently um, uh, inherently affine. So, um, you know, if I want to extend these sort of results to the divisor or, you know, uh, the Landau-Ginsburg potential, um, that's probably not something that uh, this can do, at least not with some major kind of... Uh, new ideas, I guess. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, great. So, uh, any questions before I move on to like the actual work? Okay, great. So, um, yes. Um, yes, yeah. so this is sort of worked out by, um, uh, I don't know the history so well. So we sort of learned from it from um, Vivek Shende and um, uh, I think a couple of collaborators of uh, his who, um, this thing, uh, another way to describe it is you're kind of starting with uh, T star T2, and then you're attaching um, curves kind of to the 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. Uh, curves in the torus. And this has um, kind of like a cluster interpretation, as I understand, like, um, you know, this kind of being a cluster chart and then attaching these uh, curves is kind of giving you the mutations to other cluster charts. Um, and so this kind of original mirror symmetry is not uh, due to us at all. And it's, it's not due to them either. I believe it was worked out previously because I think this is the affine part of something toric, if I believe. But um, I'm quite unfamiliar with the history, unfortunately. But I think it goes back quite a ways. <clears throat> OK. So. So how is this actually kind of going to work for us, this process? So, um, so first of all, l let me just say a, a couple words about uh, contact geometry to make sure we're kind of all on the same page. Um, so, um, and to do that, let me just fix the case we were talking about. Uh, surfaces, um, or 2n equals 4. Um, so then, uh, contact manifolds are going to be uh, locally equivalent to R3 with the contact manifold given by dz minus y dx. And we kind of like this picture quite a lot. And the main reason is that um, if I have a Legendrian lambda, so which just means that like alpha is 0 along it, then what that means is that um, the projection to the xz plane of lambda um, actually determines lambda. Um, and well, the reason for this is just that, well, y is dz dx, right? Um, so this is nice, not only in that like we can recover it from this lower dimensional picture, but also we know how we can isotope it through Legendrian manifolds. Because if we have just like any 
you know, hypersurface, or in this case, curve with singularities in XZ space, then we can just like uh, take the derivative and that gives us a Legendrian. And so, yeah, that's, um, I'd say that's really kind of why this contact picture is most useful is kind of we know um, explicitly how we can isotope uh, Legendrians just by drawing pictures, whereas like symplectically with Lagrangians, that's a bit harder to do. Um, okay, and now, um, at least in this dimension, really in every dimension, um, we can kind of globalize this picture. So uh, if x is a Weinstein four manifold, um, then I could say that x I start out with a manifold which just looks like um, some number of copies of B3 cross S1 stuck together. And then union, uh, some handles along um, some Legendrian link. Uh, yes, yes. Maybe this notation, or I don't know. There's not really such a good notation, but yeah, boundary connects them. Um, <clears throat> and so, in this way, you know, before I had defined this to be kind of uh, successive uh, contact handle attachments, but this kind of simplifies everything down just into a single contact manifold. So we need somewhere to kind of start from. Um, So the thing is, like, so abstractly, the fact that uh, affine varieties admit this structure is easy because, you know, it's just the Morse theory of this function, right? But um, doing this, like, in particular examples is kind of hard because what you're doing is, in theory, you're... Um, like you want to look at the descending manifold here, so that's integrating some ODE. Um, well, okay, say so you do that. And now you're looking at um, the kind of contact level set, and that's some contact manifold, so you need to con calculate that contact structure, find some contact amorphism to the boundary of this thing so you can draw a picture of it. And so that kind of gets, uh, well, much more complicated in practice than in theory. Um, so, uh, to draw these Weinstein pictures, uh, we'll pass through um, Lefschetz uh, vibrations. Um, so Lefschetz vibrations, you know, I think most people know what this is. And it's, this is kind of a real Morse theory here, uh, whereas this is kind of a complexified Morse theory. So this is easier to get from, from polynomials because we're always just working with complex functions. But being a Morse theory, it's kind of a natural step along the way to this more real Morse theory. Um, <coughs> And in fact, what we're going to talk about, what we'll use as a tool is um, uh, 
We'll work with left jets, uh, five vibrations. Um, and so this is a picture uh, kind of, I guess, mostly due to Seidel, also like, um, I guess, uh, Denise done a lot of work with this, and Mydansky, and um, uh, others. Um, so let me describe what this picture uh, is. Um, so just quickly, if I have some X, oh, let me do this on a new board. So if I have some x, then I'm going to take some uh, left jet's vibration, let me call it pi, which maps to c. And so in c, I'm going to have some uh, number of critical values, right? And um, then I'm going to have a generic fiber here. And if I choose some um, vanishing paths to my critical points, get my collection of vanishing cycles. And that collection of vanishing cycles uh, determines the symplectic topology of X. Um, so pi gives a ordered collection of Lagrangians V1 up to V, uh, better not use K, Vm inside of the smooth fiber. Uh, OK, so that's a left shuts vibration. Now, what makes it a bifibration is I have my, uh, so this copy of C, right? So. I have my fiber, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a uh, second left shuts vibration on the fiber, and so this maps down to C, but I think of this as being kind of a different copy of C. Um, and now this has some, um, you know, collection of critical points. And now, one would hope, and this is something that can kind of be done uh, in many examples, is that um, each of these vanishing cycles in sigma is given as a matching path in uh, This, um, this left shuts vibration. So what that means is um, <clears throat> so what that means is that these are you know arcs connecting two critical points together. So that's giving me kind of two thimbles, and then I'm gluing them together along their boundary to get a Lagrangian sphere. And that sphere should give my VK. Um, and then you know, back here, there's some other fiber. And yeah, which is something. Um, typically, will be an AN singularity in examples. Um, so. Now, for general examples, um, we typically want to assume at least that, well, 
So the setup we use in the paper we wrote is that sigma should be a plumbing of spheres. Um, in general, it could kind of work in more generality than that. Um, but for all the applications we know of, you know, in particular all the, exam the examples I mentioned, um, sigma will be either AK or DK, the Milner factor, the singularities. Um, and so kind of very particular uh, plumbing of spheres. So I want to point out, like, it's, it's in no way necessary for us that this is AK or DK, because we don't, um, like, require any understanding of the compact Fukai category of this. Um, really, kind of, from our perspective, all plumbings of spheres are sort of on equal ground, but AK and DK just happen to be the simplest. Um, hmm? In this case, sigma is, yeah, uh, Riemann surface. Uh, I mean, it's a plumbing of annuli. In general, when I say plumbing of spheres, I mean a plumbing of T star SNs. So uh, a surface is like a plumbing of T star S1s. You know, like, for example, a punctured torus is a... Uh, plumbing of two annuli, right? Um, that sort of thing. Um, thank you for bringing that up, though, because, uh, you know, in general, plumbing of spheres is a bit restrictive. Uh, but, of course, in this dimension, it's not restrictive at all. Um, okay. So, uh, let me talk about this example x. So back to x. Uh, so, um, oh, and another nice thing about uh, the affine case is, uh, as compared to the Stein case, um, is that in order to find this left shift vibration, we can just take a generic linear section. This is due to Mark McLean. Um, in general, uh, this kind of can be done in theory for uh, transcendental Stein manifolds. But it involves going through Giroux Pardon, which involves kind of taking uh, very high degree sections. And well, things get maybe too complicated to ever work out in examples. Um, but anyway, so we do this here. And uh, you might recognize that in this case, sigma is uh, just going to be a D4 singularity. Uh, since it's sort of a generic cubic, I guess. Um, and maybe I should even be more explicit than that and say that. So D4 is a thrice punctured torus, yeah? And Here's the part where things start getting colorful. So we can kind of see the D4 basis of spheres. Um, in uh, the manifold. So now, if I look at uh, I have my D4, and 
my map by row just to see. Um, so row in this case will just be a three to one uh, branch covering. And um, there'll be three different types of uh, and sing critical points. Um, so what these three points represent is, um, you know, there's, so the, ge the generic fiber is just three points. And I can, at a critical point, any set of two of those is coming together. So it could say that like the open dot is where one and two collide, the closed dot is where one and three collide, and the X is where whatever the third one, I didn't say yet. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the Lefschetz picture of D4 um, as uh, a Lefschetz vibration with fiber A2, I guess. Three points is uh, plumbing of two S zeros. Um, but anyway, so to draw these curves now, I can draw them like so. <clears throat> so here's my D4 basis in uh, this downstairs picture. Um, notice that the uh, red, blue and green are sort of all disjoint from each other, and the yellow intersects each of them once. Um, something that maybe seems a little bit strange is that this curve and this curve, they're connecting this closed dot to this open dot. The reason for that is I'm doing a monodromy around this x, right? And so this kind of involves points one and three. This involves points two and three. But on the way of connecting them, I go around this one, two monodromy, which exchanges them. This is the map, like z squared, right? There's kind of nothing deep here. Uh -uh. But just uh, cover what these diagrams mean. OK. And now. So let me call these, uh, give them some names. So let's maybe call this alpha, um, beta, gamma, and delta. So now, if I look at what are my actual vanishing cycles, um, so I'm going to describe them as uh, vanishing paths in this picture. Um, and uh, if I remember these correctly, I believe it's there's this path, uh, this path, this path here. This path here, and finally on that path there. And um, remember, the cyclic order is important when talking about uh, vanishing cycles. So let me make sure to get this correct. So this is one. Um, this is the second one. The third one is my white one. My fourth one is this blue. And the fifth is uh, what's left, the yellow. OK. So now, so. Why is this bifibration kind of particularly, this picture kind of particularly useful to us? Um, 
it's because it allows us to study what these curves are in terms of Dane twists on the basis that we understand. So, you know, we should think of like alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Those are just the basis in the plumbing of the spheres. So those we understand well. One, two, three, four, five is some other mess. And so we want to write them in terms of the alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, and so this gets sort of, uh, well, how challenging this is kind of depends on which curve it is, but it can kind of always be done. So, for example, if I look at the fifth curve, this is going to be um, just tau beta of alpha, right? If I start with alpha and do a Dane twist around the curve beta, so that's something which kind of wraps it around like that, that's giving me this uh, yellow curve here. Um, Then, uh, <clears throat> so then there's kind of a couple easy ones, right? So four is just gamma, three, oh, is it, is it, well, let me just do it in white. Um, what was two? So two is a bit harder. So let me just kind of write it down. Two is tau delta inverse, tau gamma inverse of alpha. And finally, sorry? Oh, yes. Wait. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> Good thing, too, because I'm going to try and do all this by hand. So, um, and finally, one is ch -ch -ch. tau alpha, tau beta, tau delta inverse, tau gamma inverse of alpha. OK. And so now I'm kind of uh, in business. Um, there's maybe one thing to say here, which is that uh, you can interpret this in two different ways. You could say that these curves are, um, you know, half Dane twists around arcs in the plane. Or I could say that they're Dane twists around the corresponding curves in the surface. Um, turns out it's the, the same thing because it's just kind of like double covering. But, um, Maybe more interesting than that is that uh, in higher dimensions as well, it also holds that the kind of symplectomorph or that you know diffeomorphism group of the plane with marked points lifts uh, through Dane twists to symplectomorphisms, you know, Dane twists of the corresponding Lagrangian spheres. So we can take these to be Lagrangian Dane twists around Lagrangian spheres as well as arcs along arcs. And now, all of this was kind of uh, just to put things in a language that um, the contact geometry can understand. 
So now let me uh, get to this. So my contacts manifold is, um, so here uh, I'm looking at the boundary of four copies of B3 cross S1, right? So if I look at the, the boundary of sigma cross D2, that's S1 cross S2 uh, to the fourth power, since this has it's a plumbing of four, four spheres. And this has the standard uh, contact structure on it. And now the main point is that uh, kind of locally, we understand how uh, Dane twists act on Legendrian lifts. So I'm not going to kind of define that combinatorics uh, in general, because it's a little bit tricky, but I'm just going to show you the output of it and um, Maybe you'll, and yeah? The left again oh, thank you. Is this, uh, this is uh, better here? OK, great. So then we have. So we think of this picture as being, um, you know, just kind of R3, in my original contact picture of R3 up here, um, with kind of four wormholes. I've kind of arranged the wormholes in such a way that they kind of have uh, this D4 intersection pattern, which uh, kind of matches that. Um, and so now I just kind of write things down from here. Um, now, the hardest one you might guess is uh, one, so let me do this first. Um, so it's uh, gamma inverse a beta to delta um, two is in red, and that's just a uh, Delta inverse gamma inverse of alpha. Um, so you can sort of see by the way I'm doing things that, um, you know, at least kind of the homology classes line up. And you can maybe see that like the sort of crossing is an inverse Dane twist and this cusping is a positive Dane twist. And anyway, there's some kind of combinatorics defining this. Um, I have just beta is three and just gamma is four. And then finally, five is tau beta of alpha. Um, which then is looking like this. And if you notice the sort of ordering, the cyclic ordering, which is important for my left shed's vibration, is important here in terms of how far up I'm kind of graphing each of these. OK, so I'm almost out of time, but let me kind of say the main point. Once I'm to this uh, you know, real Morse theory picture, this Weinstein picture, I can start doing uh, what's called Legendrian Kirby calculus, or Weinstein Kirby calculus, which allows me to do sort of many simplifications, which are just soft isotopies, but kind of will make my computations of Fukaya categories much easier. So for example, like I can cancel out my delta handle like this. Um, anyways, you, you shouldn't necessarily be able to follow this unless you're already familiar. But um, I'm just trying to convince you that there kind of is such a thing as this combinatorics. 
And then so this kind of pulls through here to this. Um, this thing cancels here, and so this will just all look like uh, this. Um, this thing here will cancel, and so that just ends up looking like that. And then finally, I can cancel this here. And now, um, if you're quick uh, with your Reitermeister moves, you might re realize that this is the same thing as the Legendrian trefoil knot. Um, oh, well, anyway, it's the Legendrian trefoil knot. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Um, it looks like this. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> But so anyway, and so now things are kind of easy. We can calculate the LCH of this. This is kind of the first example of LCH you ever learned to calculate. And it, again, gives you this algebra back, kind of uh, realizing mirror symmetry. Um, but what I want to highlight is that before I even started any pseudo-holomorphic computations, by doing soft topological cancellations, I was able to reduce this thing to a diagram with just one Legendrian inside of the three sphere. And there's kind of no way to do that in the Lefschetz world, right? There's no way to represent a manifold this complicated by something with just a single vanishing cycle. So you're kind of forced to have multiple objects if you're doing sort of uh, localized uh, Seidel Fukaya category. Whereas here, because context topology allows more simplifications, you can kind of uh, reduce things to fewer objects that you need to work with before starting the computations. Um, all right, I'll stop there. Thanks.